Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. And this is Monica Hadley, your host, and I'm with my mother, Caroline Kilborn. And good afternoon, everyone, <clears throat> or whenever you're listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> On another very, very hot summer day in Iowa. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Makes the corn grow. You know that. It does. Yeah. I guess it's good for something. And fortunately, we don't have like, usually we don't have weeks and weeks of really hot weather. So no, it's not that's too bad. true. Yeah. yeah. So our guest today is Andrea Tomey. She's a former broadcast journalist, having covered both sports and news during her career. In her novel, she explores some of her favorite travel destinations from the foothills of the Smoky Mountains to the Colorado Rockies, painting rich backdrops that become characters themselves. Tommy lives in Chicago with her husband, a retired Hall of Fame baseball player, and their two children. She spends her spare time traveling and photography. The book that we're talking about today, House of Belonging, follows Seeds of Intention and Walland in the award-winning Hesse Creek series. So this is book three in the series. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Andrea. Gosh, thanks for having me, ladies. Nice to spend the afternoon with you. So what took you from sports and news journalism to writing novels? Uh, well, I definitely took the long way around to, to becoming <laughs> a novelist. I w- was doing sports and news um, right out of college and then uh, met my husband interviewing him um, back in 1995 oh. <laughs> when I was actually a sports reporter. I know, it was, I always tell people it was a great interview. <laughs> it ended up, if, it were, if it were a poor interview, it wouldn't have ended the, the same way. But um, yeah, so I interviewed him and shortly after that, um, and when we started dating, I made the switch to news. And then once we got married, and I always knew I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and raise my kids at least while they were young and, and have let them have my full attention if I was so blessed, and I was. My husband's um, job afforded us that opportunity, and we did travel a lot. So we just traveled together as a nuclear family, and I raised our kids uh, and got them into school full-time. And, and then a few years ago, my mom, um, who I was very close with and who was a self-published poet herself, um, became ill, and after um, a kind of a long illness, we lost her at the end of 2014. And so at that point, I at all, some writing's always something that I loved, and I'd thought about trying to write a book. Um, I thought it would be a children's book, and this is not a children's <laughs> no, series. It's, not. <laughs> it's more of a what to read when you're wanting to be inspired to create children, I guess you could say. So <laughs> um, it's, it's a romance. It's a romance. Right. It's a love story. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So I so yeah. So I just I sat down, sort of as an homage to my mom, and sort of as a way to grieve, and you know, kind of just it was a cathartic experience. I just started writing, and Walland kind of poured out. I had no plan, and it just it just kind of came through me. And where was now, Walland even if you, set? <clears throat> Walland is set um, on a resort that's actually a real place that my husband and I have been. Um, about a dozen times. It's in um, the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, so it's outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, about 20 minutes. It's a really dreamy, beautiful place where during the day you can be in fishing waders and, you know, on hiking trails and dirty, and then at night you can have a beautiful romantic dinner, and it's kind of the best of all worlds, really. Yeah. We just spent some time in in the the Black Hills and... and, uh, it was a dreamy place at times, too. I know what you're saying. Gorgeous. That morning, you know why they call it the Smoky Mountains, that sort of mist that settles over everything yeah. in the morning. It's yeah. so beautiful. My aunt painted a picture of that for me, and uh, oh. I really treasure that. Yeah. Well, the cover, the cover of Walland, actually, is the boathouse at the resort, and you can kind of see on the cover, I mean, I, I add, embellished it a little bit, my photograph, but it does have sort of that misty look over the water, and that's it's like that, in my experience, every morning that I've woken up on that farm it's been like that mm-hmm. now when you started great memory, writing that did you think it was going to turn into a series oh not at all <laughs> <laughs> i finished walland and i thought okay i i feel pretty good about this i i um and then got it into production and um and and as i was doing that i was simultaneously the writing felt had felt so good that i started writing something else and it was a completely different book 
but it wasn't coming as easily to me. It was I was about three chapters in, and while I liked what I had, it just wasn't effortless the way that Walland was. And so my girlfriends at the time who I was letting preview Walland were all saying to me, well, you've got to write another book about these people. There's got to be more. Like, tell us, you know, so-and-so's story or this person's story. So I thought, okay, well, let me set this book aside that I was working on and try it and see if something comes. And sure enough, so that was the beginning of Seeds of Intention, and it just, it was like I turned the faucet back on, and the water just started to flow again. So then I knew, about halfway through Seeds, I knew it was going to be a three-book series, and then House of Belonging followed this year. Wow. That's, uh, that's what I was wondering. Do you do you know what the ending's going to be when you start your novel? I mean, you have an idea of how it's going to develop, or... Is well, probably smart think? smart people probably do know what the ending is going to be, <laughs> but that has not been the case for me. I just sort of like to fly without a net and just kind of see where the story takes me and what the characters tell me to do, and I just kind of free flow right. I have an overall kind of an outline of things that I want to happen in the story, but I never really know when they're going to happen until I'm writing. Well, you know, as, as beginning writers, and, and I know we have some listeners like that, that's important to know that you don't have to know the ending, that you can let it, it come as you, as you develop it. You develop the story. I think that's so true. Everybody does it so differently. And, uh-huh. you know, it's interesting. I read a book. Everyone was telling me after I started writing, you know, oh, you should read this book by Stephen King called On Writing. It's nonfiction. I'm not a Stephen King reader just because I spent way too much time, you know, when my husband was on the road in a house by myself and I had a scaredy cat, <laughs> so I can't read scary books. But I, his his book on writing about the process of writing is fascinating for anybody who is thinking that they might want to try to write a book or a blog or whatever it is. But everything, you know, so I, I start reading this halfway through Wall and everything he says to do, I'm not doing any of it. He says, write in an office with a door that closes. Well, my office is in the back hall and, you know, at any given time, cats, kids, husbands are trolling through, tapping me on the shoulder. So I, I, I learned a lot from reading his book and then I had to give myself an office with a door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, I think knowing the ending is probably more important if you're writing a mystery mm-hmm. or a or a suspense novel where you've got, you know, you have to be dropping the clues all along the way as sure. to what's ha- what's mm-hmm. going to happen. And we have talked to writers who who think they know the ending and as it gets closer it changes and then they have to go back and do a lot of rewriting. Um, So that can happen too. But it's hard, I think it can be hard for some people if they don't know what they're writing towards. But in in a romance it's a little easier because in the end the boy gets the girl or vice versa. That is one thing that is definitely a hallmark of my writing is I think there's so much darkness and garbage in the world that I wanted when my girl and I write for my girlfriends and I write for you know women of all ages I would hope but you know I'm in my mid-40s and I just think when I close a book at the end of the night and I click my lamp off I want to go to sleep feeling good I want to feel uplifted or or you know so so that's that's going to always be something I think who knows until it's something that I do differently but for now I feel pretty strongly about that. Right. I think happy endings. I think that's great. I really do because there yeah. there are too few happy endings in this world. Truly, today. truly. You know, I was in um, I w- was in New York last month and doing a Broadway week, and one of the plays that I saw was The Iceman Cometh, starring oh. Denzel Washington and Colm Meany. It's written by Eugene O'Neill. I knew nothing about the play before I went. It's a three hour and fifty minute production, so it's really long. <sighs> It's wonderful, but the whole way through, I'm thinking somebody has to change and and something good has to happen somewhere along the way. Isn't well, that interesting? Sorry to tell you, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't happen. Huh? It doesn't happen. <laughs> somebody oh, wow. changes, but it's not for the good. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? And you know, and and that there's value in that too. It's just that's just not my that's not my path yeah. in this life. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I'm glad that you like happy endings because uh, that's, that's that's uplifting. It really is. And and the other thing I don't love, I don't love cliffhangers. For me, I <laughs> want, I like to wrap up when like each of my three, even though they are connected, 
they're connected in that, uh, like one of the characters in Walland, who's a very secondary character, becomes the main character in the second book. And I know a lot of authors like to do that. But I really do tie up the storyline of everybody that's, you know, the main characters in the first book so that it's not, oh, okay, you, you know, I'm, I'm just getting you on the hook to buy the next one. I want people to buy the next book because they like my writing, not because they need to know what happened. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, a lot of times with series, you, there is one protagonist that carries through mm-hmm. from one book to the next. And this is a, very different than that. I could, as I was reading House of Belonging, not having read your previous books, I could mm-hmm. kind of see, oh, that must have been a main character in a prior book. And um, Yes. Yeah. So India, India and Wyatt were the first two main characters in Walland. Um, and I thought, boy, how am I ever going to top? Like, I really liked both of them. <laughs> but then, you know, then Garrett and Willow come along in the second book, and they're so different. And, and then, you know, the same with my characters in House of Belonging. They're all different, but they all were... I feel like destined to kind of come together in this story. The overarching theme, I think, kind of of the series is, you know, you have a family that you're born into and then the family that you kind of create for yourself throughout your lifetime as you yeah. grow older and, you know, you kind of choose who you are around the majority of the time and that's kind of a second family. Right. If, if, you're, if you're really fortunate, you can do that. Not everybody can. Truly. But, yeah, that's, um, that, you're right. It's, it, it's but this is a happy ending, so we know they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah right, exactly. Yeah. You're listening to Writers' Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Andrea Tomey, author of House of Belonging, a Hess Creek novel. Now, what is Hess Creek, and what does it mean to you? So Hess Creek is, again, um, Walland, which is the name of the first book. Um, Walland is the name of the very small town where the resort of Blackberry Farm is located in Tennessee. So I wanted that whole book to be connected to, to, to Blackberry Farm and to Walland. And so behind uh, the property runs the Hesse Creek. And it's a place where we've, my husband and I have sat in Adirondack chairs along the creek and watched the river rush by so many times for years and years. And it's just, I like the idea of the river, how you can't push the river. The river just flows, and it's going to do what it uh-huh. wants to do. And just that whole symbology I thought was really uh, appropriate for this series. Well, you know, you say it's like life. You can't push life. It just kind of flows. It does. It does. Yeah. I, love, I always tell my kids, you can't push the river. And they go, oh, stop saying that. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. It is. I, you know, I never thought of that before, but that's absolutely true. Yeah. And you know what? I bet when they grow up, they're going to be saying it too. Well, of yep. course, because I say everything my mom said. So, and I told I told my mom I had the luxury of, although she was ill at the end, and when she was in hospice, I did have the the luxury of the moment to tell her, Mom, I just want to go on record as saying you were right about everything because she really <laughs> was. I mean, it, she was. Let's face it. And I just I hope one day my kids have the chance to tell me that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right or wrong? So too. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of oh. one of the things that my mother used to say a lot when we were kids, because it was a family of five, and so getting everybody um, going in the same direction wasn't always easy. And oh, so she, when we like finally get in the car, we're off like a herd of turtles. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and, That's great. I might have to borrow that. <laughs> and and on this past uh, this family trip that we just took to the Black Hills and. Four of the five of us were there. My oldest brother couldn't make it, and some of the grandkids and great grandkids. So there were about twenty of us all together. And um, one of my younger brother came up with a, a new spin on that one. As we we're trying to get going somewhere, he said, "Well, we're turtling." Oh, that's great. <laughs> so now, you, on your next trip, you need shirts with turtles, and you can you can take this so many directions. Yep, you know, the sky's yep. the limit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you kind of because with this type, you know, with the books that you write, you know, there's going to be a happy ending. How do you keep the interest of the reader in the throughout the whole novel? Well, I let, I, my goal is to create characters. I say when I write my male characters, I write a character that, well, I'm very blessed to have a very, a husband who is so kind 
and supportive and funny and he, and I just think he's everything and I hope to raise a son that will be like that and that will be all of those things for the spouse that he chooses and 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 the same for my female characters I want to write strong and independent but still soft and vulnerable women and so I hope that in the characters that I write just that they're interesting enough and that their interests hold readers interest but also I mean, there's always a little bit of something, you know, I hope, um, like, for example, there's a parental issue in House of Belonging and, and that, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but, um, mm-hmm. and that's a character who was in um, Seeds of Intention and, and everyone's just like, what a horrible character. Oh, my gosh. But I wanted to show with that character that I think everybody has at least some redeeming quality. It's just a matter of putting them in the position to find it or to mine it or, um, to allow them to show it, to allow them to learn it themselves. So, you know, all, all that I think kind of goes into it. I hope it's just weaving an interesting story. How did I don't think it has to, to be. Yeah, I, I, the, the greatest compliment I've ever gotten is someone told me, you know, gosh, I love that your men aren't brooding. They're not angry. They're not <laughs> quick-tempered. You know, and I don't want to write that because there's enough of those in the real world too. Yeah, yeah. No, your, your men are um... – no, they are uplifting. I'm, I will say. Now, I'm using that word again, but that, that that's what they are. Well, you know, thank you. The, the thing, yeah, the things that Logan does. I'm not going to spoil it by telling him what he does. But, yeah. So, how how did you decide to set this this book in Aspen? Well, the second half of Seeds of Intention was set in Aspen, and I didn't really see it coming that it was going to change. When I when I realized it was a series, I thought it would all be built in Tennessee, but. Just kind of, it it came to me one night. I was, you know, basically woke up out of a sleep, and I knew it was going to take a turn. And it's oh. another place in the country that I love. I'm a mountain mama. My mom grew up in Morgantown, West Virginia. I have mountain, you know, I just, it's in my blood, I think. So when it went west, um, the third book, I just, I felt like it needed to stay there and wrap up there. It still has ties back to Tennessee, loose ties. Um, but I, this character, Lena, who is a female chef, she would, had a very brief moment in Walland, and I didn't really think about her again until I was writing Seeds of Intention, and I happened to see a documentary on a female chef named Dominique Crenn um, on this chef's table that's on Net, uh, Netflix. And it was an incredible documentary on this woman, and she was so inspiring, and she talked about how difficult – it is how it's really a man's world to be a chef and to be to really succeed at a high level as a female is very difficult and that was so inspiring to me and i thought oh lena ming she she was in the first book and she was a chef visiting blackberry farm i wonder what her story is and that's how i started oh. thinking about house of belonging yeah it's funny you know it's just happy accidents the way this all happened so lena wasn't you know her- in the second book at all <laughs> Not at all. In fact, I didn't even know she was going to come back, and then she just poked her head out of nowhere. So, yeah, okay, there she was. Because she has so much backstory that I just oh, assumed I know. that that was part of a, an earlier book. No, because once I started to really think about, okay, who she, who is she, and how did she get here? I did before with her more than any other character I've ever written. I sat down and really flushed her out and had pages and pages of who I thought she was and what I thought she'd like and what I thought her hands looked like when they worked and, you know, all of that. So I had pages and pages on her, so I did feel like I was able to sort of inhabit her pretty easily. Your writing is very descriptive. You really go into the details of the setting, of what people are doing, what they're, and um, you get a full picture. Right. Thank you. I, I like to, and you know, I travel such a big part of, uh, was, was a big part of our life in baseball and really still is. Even now that my husband's retired, he's working a couple of jobs for, that take, take us all over. I wanted these books to be, uh, like, like picking it up and going on vacation. I've had people tell me, gosh, I'll never go to Blackberry Farm probably, but I feel like I've been there. You know, and I feel like I could smell what the wood smoke smells like when the fire's crackling. And that's what I want. I want to share that, the experiences I've been really lucky enough to have. I want to share those with, with people that are reading my books. So how do you schedule your writing? <laughs> That's a great question. I So usually when I'm writing, when I'm writing a book, I'm writing every day, and I'm writing seven, eight hours a day. And it's usually it has to be when my kids are in school. In the summer, I don't get to do as much writing of the books, but I do more 
blogging. That's when I'm sort of doing my research. Kind of, I'm gearing up to write this. I've written a few chapters of the new one, but I've got a ton of research that I've worked on for it. So once the kids go back to school in September, my plan is to I can really power through and probably finish by the end of the year is my goal. Wow. Um, yeah, but oh, I'm working. Boy. But I'm treating it like a full time job. When my kids go to school at 8 a.m., I sit down and I don't get up again until 3:30 when it's time to get them. Like I am shut off the phone and I am writing. Wow. So and yeah, you don't that's get how I distracted have to do by Facebook and and uh, Pinterest and. Oh, of course. Well, so I have to go into airplane mode or I'll, you know, every time I hear a chirp or a tweet, I'll go, wait a second, what's going on in the world? And the thing that distracts me the most, and it's happening right now, is I was sitting in a chair when we started this interview, but now my one of my two cats has already decided he wanted to be there instead. So them walking across the computer is, is the most distraction because they're so darn cute. Yeah. 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 But even worse would be if you videoed them doing it and then posted it on Facebook. Oh, then they just think they were the cat's <laughs> meow if I can be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, I, I should do that. He is really something else right now. Now, you talked about you're doing a lot of research for your current book. Was much research required for these first three? You know what? I feel like I was researching it for the last 12 years and I didn't know it. Just <laughs> having traveled so many times to Walland and... Um, I took a photography work. Walland is set during a photography workshop. Walland's sort of a fast and furious book. It's it's shorter. It's set during kind of a week, and then there's an epilogue that's um, a little bit later. But uh, it all happens kind of very quickly. Um, and that was during a photography workshop that I've actually attended twice. My friend teaches it down at Blackberry Farm. So I, I guess I had been doing research without knowing it was for a book. Um, and so it came. That's why it probably came so easily. Um, seeds of intention, same kind of thing. I'm, I'm very interested in heirloom farming, and these are things I just sort of, I, when I'm interested in something, I will watch and try to absorb everything I can about it. So I knew a lot about that. The cooking took a little bit more. Um, the, house, the House of Belonging, like I said, took more research. And then this new book um, is going to be the beginning of a three-book series, and it's going to be set. It's split. The, I thought it was going to be entirely set in the Pacific Northwest, so Portland, um, and and beyond, but I think it's still going to have a tie to Nashville, which is kind of surprising me a little bit. So, and, yeah, yeah. And I understand that it centers around three brothers. Yes, there are three brothers, and uh, and so this this is a totally separate series from Hesse Creek. However, and I'm probably going to spoil this a little for you since you've read it. Uh, the, there was a character in House of Belonging that kind of came out of nowhere, and I thought he was going to be a supporting character, and he was so darn interesting. I thought, oh, gosh, well, I was ready to be done with this, but I think this is, he's going to spur a whole new a whole new collection. And so he is. It's he and his two brothers that are going to start this new series. So it's linking. All the books are linked. Yes. Well, the new, the new one really, all of the other characters in the first three are not going to be carried forward. Really, this is about him going back to where he's from and kind of that story now. Okay. But you may be surprised. Oh, I'm sure someone will show up unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> Just like company, right? Right. They always do. Right. Yeah. So is, is this new book, is this going to be a series as well? This is the first book of a, of a new series? Then? It is. I think it's going to be three books, but it's, it's hard to tell because originally uh -huh. I thought, okay, it's going to be about the three brothers. But the more I'm getting into it, I'm wondering if it's going to really be about the three women. Well, the brothers that's what I was going to secondary. ask about, you know, is writing from a male point of view – um, different for you? It's interesting. I enjoy it much more than I thought I would. In fact, it's really intriguing to me. Um, so yeah, so I've written the, the early chapters from the male perspective, but I, and the other thing I've been reading a lot of because someone asked me to write a YA novel. So I've been reading some YA, young adult stuff, which mm -hmm. um, is interesting. It's Most of that is written first person. And my books are written third person. So once I started reading that, I thought, gosh, it would be kind of interesting to really, truly inhabit a character and write in the first person. It, I guess it just never occurred to me. It didn't feel natural. Right. But I'm I'm toying with the idea of that or maybe even switching, you know, chapters. I'm not throughout. I'm going to I'm going to play around with it. It's still kind of early, but we'll see how that flushes out. So that sounds interesting. Like, does the book have a 
with the three brothers, are you switching points of view among them? Because in, in House of Belonging, you are alternating points of view. I'll probably switch not among the brothers. Uh, it'll be uh, between one of the brothers and the main female character. I will switch probably points of view between the two of them. Okay. And then when it's the next person's turn in the next book, that's when I kind of inhabit them. Because I sort of, I really do sort of make them secondary. Uh, they'll be, they'll have a prominence, but not from a point of view standpoint. Mm. When you're Sounds writing, oh, go ahead, Mom. Oh, that, that it sounds interesting. I'm looking forward to reading that. Oh, thank you. When you're writing um, a multi kind of multi perspective, multi point of view book, how how do you keep the the um, keep them separate in your own mind? Do you ever get kind of mixed up? I've never had that happen to me I just feel like each of the characters are so distinct in my mind anyway mm -hmm. I hope it's not confusing as a reader did you find at any point that you were having to go back and look on and then although you did come in on a third book so there were characters but did it seem confusing to you no, at all? it wasn't as... confusing I did you know there I was going back and forth because there were quite a few characters early that were there were introduced early in the book that I wasn't I couldn't remember how they were related to one another if sure. I had mm -hmm. read the earlier books, I would have, like, India and Wyatt and, and um, Susan and Finn. and Willow, Willow and Garnet. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was a little... Garrett, I mean. And then there was another a couple, too. Violet, Violet, maybe? Violet and Rex, yes. Yeah. Violet and Rex. Yeah. And so, you know, these are all in addition to the, the main two. Yes, right. And then there's Van and... Um, you know, some other single, not coupled characters. And so I was a little bit, and a little bit, it, it was a little bit difficult at times for me to... Overwhelming a little bit, yeah, yeah coming in, not knowing the remember who backstory. everybody was in relationship to everybody else. Well, maybe I need one of those little maps in the beginning. Like, you know, you know that Diana wouldn't Gamble be on. a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Maybe well, I will do that going forward, especially if it's going to be as... Uh, you know, a tangled web that I'm weaving here in the next series. We'll see. And also, I well, wasn't I have... reading. If I'd picked it up and read it start to finish, it would have been different. Mm -hmm. But I, there was some time between when I picked right. it up, and then I'd, I'd have to refresh myself. Got it. Well, that's good feedback well, for me, for sure. Well, what I do is what I have to do in order to keep track of things is I write the name of a character and something about them, like uh, the, the main character was a chef and she was adopted. And Logan turns out to be a, 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 her boyfriend, and so forth. And Van is her coworker, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then I, then I, keep, I can keep them straight otherwise. <laughs> well, that yeah, I, especially with this many characters. I know it, it was it was by the third book, and I did have to go back and reference timelines and stuff like that a lot more. And that was a new experience for me, being that this is my first series. So right. uh, mm -hmm. that was there was a little bit of when this series ended, a little bit of a. Okay, freedom from that, what, that felt a little bit, rest I'm a Sagittarius, I don't like to be rest pinned down. <laughs> I like to move around the building and have freedom, and so that was starting to feel a little bit like, oh, my hands are tied in some of these things I want to do because of the time. Well, like I said before, you know, the um, sometimes when writers, things change later in a book and they go back and rewrite and change the beginning, but if you've already published the beginning, you can't do that. That's very true. <laughs> it does limit what you can do, sure. Well, you it's funny you mentioned something that I um that I've been thinking about a lot lately that kind of came to me. My uh one of my characters Finn, who is the master gardener at um in Walland and he is in all three books, sort of a, pr a prominent f figure. Um and and then Susan, their love story is told in Walland. Um but he, I, I want, I like writing love stories for all ages as well. I feel like Indian Wyatt's story was happening, but kind of at the same time, Susan and Finn's story was happening, and they're in their 70s. And I didn't realize at the time that I think I was trying to manifest something for my father because my dad had become a widow. You know, he'd been married to my mom for 48 years oh. when we lost her. And I was really, and my mom, before she died, said, you know, she she gave my dad the permission. She's like, I want you to find somebody. I want you to not, not be alone. And 
you know, she was so wonderful in that way. And maybe I was wishing that for him in writing Finn's story. And then he has just in the last year met the most wonderful woman. And I was sitting with them recently and I, I had like this epiphany. I said, you guys, I think that me writing that story was really wishing for what you guys have right now. Oh. And it was oh. a cool moment. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Yeah. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Andrea Tomey, author of House of Belonging. So, Mom, when you were reading, um, were there any particular characters that really drew you? Well, yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, was, I was interested in, in Van because he was... Uh, he knew that he he really had a great admiration for <coughs> excuse me Lena, but he didn't didn't pursue it because he knew that that she needed space and that she needed to find herself after a, a difficult relationship before. And I I just admired him so much. He's one of the most interesting characters that have ever that I've written. I think I think he's. Um, there's a lot to mine there with him, and he's, you know, he is going to be the the, per, the character that I'm starting with, the genesis of this next series. I was hoping so. Yeah, he <laughs> is. He's, I, I'm glad you re, you really were drawn to him because I feel the same way, and I felt like I knew he wasn't the one for Elena, but he's going to be the one for someone, and it's going to be. I think it's just going to be the most amazing story. I think he's mm-hmm. got a really cool destiny out of him, so I'm excited to yeah, write his yeah, story. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, so good. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, the Scottish accent. It's by itself, I mean, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I watch Outlander. I that I read Diana Gabaldon and I watch uh, Outlander. Yes. <laughs> yeah, little Scottish influence there. Little nod to one of my favorites. <laughs> now, Andrea, I understand <laughs> you do the cover art for your books. I do. So I took all three of the photographs, and then I work with my um, publisher, Girl Friday, to you know they kind of help me with the layout and design and stuff. But uh, and so the first two covers were were the first cover Walland. I knew what it was going to be. The boathouse is an iconic image of Blackberry Farm. I knew that's what it would be. And then Seeds of Intention, when it moved to Aspen, I knew I wanted it to be something in Aspen, and I knew it was going to be a winter scene, but I didn't know what the picture was. My best friend and I flew the day after Christmas, um, a few year, two, two years ago, I guess it was, to Aspen, and I just said to her, I'll know it when I see it. Um, so we booked, I booked a snowmobile trip up to Maroon Bells. I thought it might be Maroon Bells in the winter, which is a gorgeous sort of a, one of the most photographed places in all of, of Colorado. And we got up there and along the way I just kept looking up and the, the, the blue sky and the white birch trees or uh, aspen trees rather that look like birch trees are, it was so striking and so like the beauty was so bare but so powerful. I thought well, that's it. So, um, so that one, that's how that one came about. And then with House of Belonging, I had a completely different image on the cover of a really beautiful, we spent last summer in California for my daughter to do a show. She's a singer. And, uh, there were, I was so taken by all the gorgeous succulents that people have in California. There was a beautiful pink and green one, sort of the same colors that I ended up choosing on the cover. But when I showed, uh, Girl Friday, my publishers, they said, you know, the first two books are really, pictures, photographs of scenes that people would want to, that, that invite the reader in, that they would want to step into. And while the succulent was a beautiful photograph, it wasn't that scene. And as soon as she was saying that, and I was kind of looking through pictures, I came across the swing. And I just, I don't know, it just felt right. It was the same mm-hmm. colors. It was almost like I was I was brought back around to it. So, it, yeah, but I, I've, I really loved uh, I love having that personal connection with the cover. I want someone to pick up the book and say, what is this about? Oh, definitely. Right. Well, what's that old saying? You can't tell a book by its cover. You but can't, you know, right? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes a cover makes a big difference, too. I, yeah, I hope so. Now, I noticed that um, this is published by Hesse Creek Media in Chicago. Yes. So tell us who and what that is. I'm assuming well, it's that you're very uh, I, involved in that. <laughs> I am. I started the publishing brand myself, the imprint myself, because 
my mom self-published her poetry 20 years ago in a time that was very much a different landscape in self-publishing than it is today. I mean, she really had to, it was an uphill climb for her. Uh, for me, I thought, you know, let me, when I worked in television I, and I started out, I had to carry my own camera. I had to set it up. I had to push record. I had to go around the front and do my stand up and then go back to the, <laughs> make sure I was centered oh and then gosh. go back to the studio. I mean, I did a one man band, we used to call it. So I was a one man band. And I thought, I learned so much and it made me so much better when I eventually became an anchor and because I knew the business from the inside out. And so I wanted to afford myself that same kind of educational opportunity here. So I committed to self-publish the first series myself, and it, it's been so much fun. I was thinking, okay, well, now I'm going to shop this next series, but I'm not sure I will. I really enjoy it, and now I have an imprint that's got some a little bit of heft behind it, and you know, it's a little more recognizable that maybe ultimately what I'm supposed to do is help other people who want to publish mm. using my imprint. So, mm, Yeah. Well, one one thing about that I have noticed over the years is we – you know, get a lot of books from authors that often you can tell the self-published books by the way they look. Right. And yours doesn't look self-published. Oh, well, that means a lot to me. Um, I really work hard to make sure that I wanted it to have a nice professional look, a nice finished mm -hmm. look. Right. And it's Thank everything you. from the weight and color of the page, the type font, um, certainly the cover, but the layout, there's so much to it. And I know that, you know, Amazon and these and some of these other self-publishing um, venues can help you do that more professionally, but it really takes somebody with, a, with an aesthetic sense to really get it right, I think. Well, the... the, the company and you know a lot of people are I, I consider myself an indie publisher more than a self publisher so I do have a lot of help this company that I mentioned before Girl Friday Productions they're based on the west coast and Portland and Seattle and it's it's primarily women with a few really great guys who are involved actually one of the guys um, Paul helped do my cover he's really talented but they help um, if, if for anybody that's looking who has material that wants to publish and have it really look professional and, and done, I would re highly recommend them. I've worked with them for all three of my books. And they have um, stables of editors, so I had my books go through not only a developmental edit you know, for the story, but also a copy edit and then a proofread, and then they do a professional pour of the words, and you get to you know, check that out. And I mean, they really do, they really did everything like that for me and with me. And that was, I could not have done it without them. They're an incredible company. And that was Girl Friday Publications? Girl Friday Productions. Mm -hmm. Girl Friday Productions. Wow. And then, uh, you know, in the same token, it, it really helps to have a great publicist working with you. And I have a fantastic one. And they're based in Nashville and New Orleans, JKS Communications. They've really helped me. They helped bring me to you. So thank you Absolutely. to them for that. That's yeah, right. they're just yeah. wonderful. That help you. You need all the help you can get because the writing is the easy part. We've <laughs> it's all with, the other stuff. Yeah, we've worked with quite a few of their authors. Um, yeah, they're wonderful. Yeah, and and well, sometimes yeah. I feel like you know by having a publicist like that when you're trying to get interviews, it actually, for, as the person doing the interviews, the publicist is kind of a first line of filter. Yeah. So they're not, mm -hmm. I, I trust them not to send me something that's not very good. You know? Yeah, that's not a good fit for you. Right, right exactly. Right. So that, that yeah. really helps. That really helps. Well, I think well, it's, important for, that. it's important for beginning writers to know that they need all this help too, you know? Uh, and I and I think you can piece it together as you go. I don't want to scare anybody away from it because, you know, I really was like Forrest Gump. I just started, put the shoes on and started running and, you know, <laughs> finally got to the end of the pier <laughs> and then just turned around and kept going. And so you can do that. It's it's okay to do that. And I would, I just got asked to teach a creative writing class at our local community house here. And I said to my husband, oh, my God, I'm not qualified for that. And then I thought, well, you know what? I guess I, if if anything else, maybe I could go in and encourage another dummy like me to just <laughs> just go for it. You know what I mean? Someone like right, like someone who didn't think they could do it, and that was me, and just just to do it. You know, the only way you know if you're gonna succeed is if you try. 
That's true. Now, so when did I, yeah. you publish Walland? Walland was published in August of 2016, and then Seeds of Intention was September of 17, and then House of Belonging just came out in June. That's Boy, a pretty that's rapid something. That's three publishing books. schedule. Yeah. You know, I have to work on a schedule, though. Otherwise, I, I'll just, you know, tiptoe through the tulips all day long. I, I really do need to keep myself to task. And this next one, I think, is going to be a September release maybe late summer release next year because it is a brand new series. And my husband's being inducted into the Hall of Fame for baseball this summer. We've had a lot Ooh. going on. So wow. I needed to give myself a little bit of liberty there to to, to have a little extra time. Yeah. Well, I, I, had, a, I had a writer's group uh, at my church for a while. And, uh, you know, somewhere in, in people's backgrounds, sometimes someone told them, a teacher or somebody told them, well, you really can't write very well. Oh. And so they, they would come to this group and they would say, well, I can't write. And I, I would say, it's just like talking. You just write it down instead of, you know, saying it out loud. You're writing it down. And That's... some of them really got to be quite good, I thought. And uh, so I was, I was pleased. Well, we need more encouragers like you. You know, my, my mom tells a story about in the fourth grade, an art teacher told her that she would never be an artist, that her art was terrible. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. it's amazing how somebody can tell you something like that one time young in life that you're not good at something and you believe them. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, right. So, yeah. It's incredible. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Andrea Toomey, author of House of Belonging. Andrea, I understand that you have an audiobook version of House of Belonging, and I'd like to share a little bit of that with our listeners today. We'll just start from the beginning. Chapter 1 She'd sworn she wouldn't look, but when the moment arrived, Lena Ming couldn't help herself. It felt like intruding on something she had no business witnessing. But Lena was confident she wasn't the only one who felt like an interloper that day, because of the way his emotions were so plainly and openly etched across his face. The groom's expression had run the gamut from carefree to nervous, to the look he wore now as his gaze finally settled on his bride. Lena felt a tightness in her throat as she watched from her seat. He was so dashing in his shirt and bow tie, with trousers held up by suspenders, a dusting of russet whiskers covering his face. But it was the raw emotion behind his smile that caused Lena to swallow hard in an effort to rid herself of the lump in her throat. She turned her attention toward the object of the man's affection. The bride's tall, slender frame was draped elegantly in the most perfect, strapless, pale yellow dress. A mane of chestnut-colored hair floated gently in the breeze behind her. She wore a crown of tiny white flowers, and as she drew closer, Lena could see tears rolling down her cheeks, in contrast to the brilliant smile on her face. Everyone gathered that evening at Walland House in Aspen, Colorado, was enchanted. They knew what Lena had come to learn over the past year. Willow Armstrong and Garrett Oliver were kindred spirits, and two of the most likable people you'd ever want to meet. It was impossible not to root for this couple's happiness. Lena had met them both the previous summer, thanks to an introduction by India and Wyatt Hinch. Mutual acquaintances who were visiting from Tennessee. Lena had only been living in Aspen for a few months at that time and had literally bumped into India coming out of a yoga class downtown one morning. They'd met a few years before when Lena had been a guest chef at the resort in Tennessee, where India and Wyatt still lived and worked. They hadn't really kept in touch, though, so they were delighted to have run into each other so unexpectedly in Aspen. Before she knew it, Lena had agreed to cater the upcoming wedding of India's dear friends and co-workers. The music ended, and Willow was standing next to Garrett at the edge of the forest, their hands clasped together. The energy between them was palpable as they stood surrounded by the glow of twinkle lights that tightly wrapped the trunk of the old oak tree, serving as their altar. It was no surprise to anyone when Garrett leaned over immediately for a soft kiss drawing an admonishment from the minister. 
Who gives this woman in marriage to this impatient young man? Finn winked at Garrett, glad for the moment of levity. The old farmer needed the opportunity to get a handle on his own emotions. He'd been stunned when they'd asked him to officiate their wedding, and even wondered if they'd been kidding. Garrett had come to feel like a second son to Finn, and was something of a brother to Finn's own adopted son, Wyatt. Finn's wife, Susan, had helped him become a minister online. And now, here he was, a bona fide preacher man. Finn raised his eyebrows expectantly at Wyatt, waiting for an answer to his question before he moved on. I do, said Wyatt, clasping Garrett on the shoulder and giving Willow a kiss on the cheek before stepping to the side to stand in line with the only other groomsman. Wyatt glanced across the altar at his own wife, who was standing up for Willow, along with their good friend, Violet. Both women had tears in their eyes, and the expression on India's face reminded Wyatt once again why he was so grateful she was his partner in life. Lena watched the exchange between them, trying to ignore the feeling of envy that bubbled up every time she was around these people, shaking her head slightly in an effort to clear the unwelcome thought. Her eyes shifted inadvertently to the other groomsmen standing next to Wyatt. He was the only one in the entire congregation who wasn't focused on the bride and groom. Instead, he was staring right back at Lena, with a corner of his mouth turned up in a slight smile. Damn. Lena knew he'd be there. After all, Logan Matthews was Willow's brother. She'd met Logan before she'd met Willow and Garrett both introductions made by the hand of India. Their first encounter had been during the food and wine classic the previous summer, after Lena had finished up her presentation on the kitchen garden. It had been obvious to Lena that India thought she and Logan would be a good match. But Lena had made it clear to Logan on several occasions since that she wasn't interested, despite his continued attempts at flirting with her. Lena had come to Aspen to begin again after abruptly ending an unhealthy relationship. The last thing she'd wanted was to wing walk into another situation like the one she'd left behind in New York. She recognized a charmer when she saw one, and she'd had enough of that type of man to last her a lifetime. It occurred to her that Logan was doing it again now, and it was unsettling. Enough so that she felt herself involuntarily frown at him before she could resist. She lowered her gaze, paying her program more attention than it deserved, but not before she'd registered his response. Is he laughing at me? Why did I give him the pleasure of a reaction at all? Lena was certain Logan wasn't used to being ignored, but that was exactly what she'd done whenever she'd seen him in town over the past year, and it's what she planned to do again that night. If she could just get through the reception, she knew she'd be much too preoccupied in the coming weeks and months to give him another thought. Besides, Lena was aware that Logan's job at Walland House was time-consuming and would keep him out of her chilly, literally and figuratively. Willow and Garrett had informed her that their new resort, Walland House, had been so well-received that they were foregoing their honeymoon until late October. That signaled the start of the shoulder season, which began at the end of autumn and lasted for the few quiet weeks before the popular ski season kicked off around Thanksgiving. Besides, the Aspen Food and Wine Classic was just a couple of weeks away, and they were all entering their busiest time of the year as a result. The Classic was the largest and most prestigious of its kind, a huge draw for the Aspen Valley each summer. Hordes of foodies showed up to mix and mingle with the top names in the food and wine industry. There wasn't much time to think about anything else during the hectic June weekend. Lena was shaken from her thoughts by a murmur from the young woman seated next to her. Isn't he adorable? How that man has managed to remain single is beyond me. The petite blonde gave her a sidelong glance before continuing. Maybe by the end of the night... He won't be. Rumor has it, he didn't bring a date. Lena followed the woman's gaze straight back to Logan, who was now watching as the bride and groom sealed their vows with a kiss. He was still wearing the same lopsided grin, however, almost as if he could feel Lena's eyes on him. 
So that was from the audio recording of House of Belonging by Andrea Toomey. So have all of your books been recorded on audio? They have, um, and, and I never expected to do that either, but then somebody said to me, gosh, I would read your books, but I'm so busy, I'm running around all the time, all I do is listen to audio books, and so I thought, well, let me explore that a little more deeply and see you know, yeah. what it takes to do that, and I really lucked out and found the most wonderful um, professional voiceover actress, uh, actor, her name is Marnie Young, and she uh, did both of the first two books for me, Walland and Seeds of Intention. And then on the third book, she suggested that we bring in a male um, voice for the male characters, so it's, a, it's called a duet narration. And the two of them, oh. I think, are just wonderful together. Fantastic. Yeah. So how did you, how did you find her, and then once, how did the recording process go? Did you have to be involved in it, or did they just know what to do and took it over? She, luckily, she is so smart. She knew what she was doing. Um, I found her through Audible. Um, Amazon, ACX is, is the website, but uh, Audible provides uh, a whole stable of people, and, and what you do is submit a chapter or two or three or whatever it is of your material, and then people can audition for you. So I got many, many people to audition, and then something about her voice, she's a Yale-trained actress, and she her voice is just, I think, like silk. I could listen to her all day. I think she's just... And she gets better with each book. I felt like mm. by House of Belonging, she really, she she's like me. She knew the characters. She related to them. You know, they resonated with her. And you, I could really tell the difference by the third book, too. Through um, her production company, Silverton Audio, they do, she does, she, she has a studio at home. And so she does a lot of her, and she's a mother of two young twins, too. So she put, you know, raises her kids all day, puts her kids to bed, and then goes into her studio at night. And she's just the most generous, kind, sharing person. If she comes across any other opportunities, she's always emailing me and saying, hey, let's do this together. And um, I've found people in, people who like books, for the most part, are generous people who want to help you. Well, just think of the, just think of the, the difference to, in to the things you can do today, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, where they didn't have all these possibilities, you know? It's remarkable. Expanding. Yeah, isn't it, though? Gosh. It is. What are they going to think of next, I wonder? Oh, gosh. I'm afraid <laughs> to know <laughs> because I won't be any good at it. I mean, I barely know how to use Skype or any of this other stuff. So. <laughs> Where did the title for, now, Walland, it was easy to see. It was named after the town. And is that a real town or was it a made-up yeah. name? Yeah. Okay. That's a, a real, very small little town in Tennessee. Okay. Yep. But... Seeds, uh, seeds of intention and house of belonging. Where, where do those titles? How did you come up with them? I, they, I really a title for me is like super important. And so I with seeds of intention. I kind of knew early on. I mean, it's a little bit of a play because Garrett is a master gardener and he's he's really literally planting seeds. But I also I feel like we can we are all in control and able to. to plant the seeds that we want by and using the intentions and, and the good in our lives really kind of manifest the kind of life that we want. Um, obviously, God willing. <laughs> but I, so that's sort of where that title came. Um, and House of Belonging is, is um, and this is, it comes out in the book what the title actually means, but it's also sort of that overarching theme of finding the place that you belong in the world, sort of finding your spot, why are we here, you know, that whole greater picture thing. But but then there's also a real nuts and bolts reason that I named it that, but I don't want to spoil it. It's in the book. And did you have other titles that you considered and threw away? I did, and I'm saving them just in case <laughs> they, good, they, good. they yeah. come in useful later, right? Right, yeah. Do you have a character that you identify with the most in, in this series? Oh. Hmm. Um, <laughs> the character that I think the character that I resonate most with, I love all of them, but I really think Violet is kind of a special character. Mm -hmm. She's she's that girlfriend that everybody needs. You know, she mm -hmm. tells it to you like it is. Um, she can lighten a heavy moment with a little bit of a laugh or a little bit of her wit. Um 
but I think she's got a, a beautiful uh, marriage. I think she and her husband have a really great relationship. I don't know. I really, I, I love. I think she's. She reminds me. She's sort of a hodgepodge of a lot of friends that I'm lucky to have. Now, was she the main character in it, in any of the three books? No, she's she's um, a secondary character in Walland. Actually, she's secondary in all three of them, but she's India's best friend and sort of she's sort of the reason India and Wyatt met okay so she's she's really I guess you could say one of the kind of a genesis of the whole thing so she but she's always a sidekick she is (laughs) and did you you weren't tempted to well I guess because she was happily married from the beginning it was hard to uh hard to make her a main character yeah and I felt like I told enough of their story in Walland you know, I, I, no, I didn't tell too much of it, but it was an. It didn't feel like there was enough there to have a whole book for her. Oh, well, that makes but sense. But I thought, but I knew she was going to be there in all three. Yeah. Well, maybe well, she'll show she, up in your next series. I was just going to say that <laughs> you just <laughs> never know because <laughs> she's pretty cool and she does. She is a photographer and she travels, and so you never know. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, it sounds like she might be the one that is also the most like you. Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, I don't know which one is most like me. I, people always ask me, or early on they used to ask me, so is India you? Because she was a broadcaster. And she, I said, well, no, I made India everything I would have loved to have been. She's 5'10". You know, she's tall. <laughs> she's, you know, like very, you know, she got the network job. But I'm not, I, I don't think I'm any of the characters. But maybe, maybe I have a little bit of Violet in me. Gosh, that, what does that say about me? That am I complimenting myself that she's my favorite? <laughs> oh, no. Somebody well, now, are favorite. any of the men um, written with your husband in mind? I think there are pieces of him in all of them. My husband is such a tender heart, and he's very romantic. Um he thinks of the little things, and I think they all, it's something that all three of them think, you know, sort of do. Um, he's considerate of feelings, and he's not afraid to show his own, and he's funny. So I think I, I sprinkled him throughout all three. <laughs> and I and I have a type. I like a bit, he, you know, they're all sort of like, none of them are slight. Yeah. <laughs> My husband's 6'4", right. and he's, you know, kind of a big guy, and they're all kind of, yeah, I definitely have a type. <laughs> Now, do your friends sometimes say, hey, is that, you know, I do that. That character does this thing that I do. Did you borrow that from me? In particular, sayings, like little things that my friends will say. They'll, they know. They'll, be, they'll think, they'll say, oh, that's so cool. And a lot of people say, when am I going to be in a box? Oh, <laughs> like they want, and I said, well, be careful what you wish for. I said, every time you tell me a story or a little anecdote, I am always storing that little information. So you never know where it's going to turn up. Do you keep a journal? Uh-huh. I don't keep a journal per se, but I have a notebook where I'll just, where especially when I'm, a lot of times when I'm waking up in the morning and if I've had a dream, I'll jot down a few words. Mm-hmm. But I don't journal too much. I feel like the writing is almost my journaling. Well, good point. Good point. Indeed. Well, Mom, do you have any more questions as uh, we're about out of time? Uh, well, we know what's next for her because she's working on it. Right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, this has been very interesting. I'm so glad that we were able to interview you. Well, this thank really you so great. much. And, and I want to thank you both so much because... You know, like I said, it's 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 an uphill climb writing and and just getting your work out there. So every opportunity, I, every author that has this opportunity is so grateful. And I am in a place of gratitude today to both of you. Thank oh. you. Well, thank you. And mom, do you have some closing words for us today? Well, I'm going to use the closing words that she used in the first one because I think it's very very true, and that is that friends can be the second family that you create for yourself. Well, thank you, and see you all next week on Writer's Voices.